Hi guys, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and we've been talking about section two. Section two is kind of like chapter two and this is atoms, molecules, and ions. So today's video is video number two from section two of general chemistry notes. So let's get started. Today, this video, we're going to talk about some of the early experiments that were used to characterize the atom. And the first one we're going to talk about is J.J. Thompson and his discovery of the electron. So at the top of page one of our notes here, it says the electron was discovered in 1903 by J.J. Thompson as he conducted experiments with a cathode ray tube. So give me a second here and I'm going to sketch out a cathode ray tube for you. It's basically just a, a cylinder and on each end we have an electrode. So on the left hand side we have a cathode and on the right hand side we have an anode. Okay, And we see that there is a current moving from the cathode to the, an to the anode. So cathode rays are moving from left to right in your notes there. Those are streams of electrons running through the cathode tube. Okay. And as I mentioned, they're going from cathode to anode. So uh, the, the image you see on the left is just the cathode ray tube by itself. I'm leaving room on the right hand side of the page because I'm now going to draw a cathode ray tube again, except this time we're going to bring an electrical field into play. So that's what you're seeing now. So on the left hand side, we just have a regular cathode ray tube. Electrons are moving from cathode to anode, okay, in a straight line produced by the applied voltage between those two electrodes. On the right hand side, I'm redrawing my cathode ray tube. Cathode is the electrode on the left. Anode is my electrode on the right. And you'll see that the electrons are being attracted to the positive end of this electric field, okay? So the negative end of the applied electric field is repelling electrons away from it, or you could say that the positive end is attracting electrons towards it, okay? All right, now let's move to the top of page two of today's notes. And we want to make a few blanket statements about what we just saw. All right, now I'm using the term rays here because he's yet to really define that these are called electrons. So it says here, because the rays, these cathode rays, were deflected away from the negative end of the applied electric field. Another way of saying that is because the rays were attracted to the positive end of the applied electric field, Thompson postulated that the cathode rays were negatively charged and he gave them a name and he called them electrons. So let's read that in kind of uh, real time. Because the rays were deflected away from the negative end of an applied electric field, Thompson postulated that the cathode rays were negatively charged particles called electrons. All right, so he recognizes now that these guys are negatively charged and he's called them electrons, but he also knows that atoms are electronically neutral overall. So he's beginning to think about positive charge is where, okay? So that's what the second star means. Second star, because atoms were known to be neutral, Thompson reasoned that there's got to be an area or a zone of positive charge somewhere in the atom as well. Now he's not aware of protons yet. Protons have yet to be discovered. So he's trying to kind of come up with an idea of where in the atom is the positive charge, All right? And he comes up with something called the plum pudding model of the atom. Now in this plum pudding model, and I'm gonna sketch it, but in the plum pudding model, the electrons are kind of like raisins in a pudding. So the electrons are negatively charged and they're little point charges. So you see all the dots I'm drawing right now? Those dots are my negative electrons. 
And then he claims that the rest of it, the pudding, if you will, or the area of the circle that I've sketched, that spherical cloud, is just a zone of positive charge, okay? So I have electrons are the little dots, and then the cloud itself, or my circle, and then the interior, the white interior, that is an area of positive charge. And again, no mention of protons, those are not discovered yet. So that's what he proposes. It's called the plum pudding model. Okay, we'll come back to the plum pudding model in a bit. This next one, 1909, Robert Milliken. Robert Milliken, he, uh, he's about six years after J.J. Uh, Thompson's discovery of the electron, right? On the last page, it was 1903. This is 1909. So in 1909, Robert Milliken performed experiments that determined the charge of the electron and the mass of the electron. So J.J. Thompson discovers the electron, 1903. 1909, Robert Milliken discovers the charge of an electron and the mass of an electron. Okay, so the mass of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. Infinitesimally small, okay. 1911, two years later, Ernest Rutherford. Okay, in 1911, Ernest Rutherford, he disproves Thompson's plum pudding model. Okay, and he does this using his gold foil experiments. Now, I'm going to draw a sketch again of the plum pudding model, and I'm going to do that right below here. But at first, it says Ernest Rutherford disproved Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom. And he discovers something in the middle called the nucleus, all right? So there's a little bullet point there underneath Ernest Rutherford. And it says his experiment involved bombarding various atoms of metal foil. And that particular metal foil happened to be gold. So he's bombarding various atoms of gold foil with these things called alpha particles. Alpha particles are just kind of low energy radiation. All right. So why is he doing this? And what is what were the results of what he was doing? Well, let's move to the next page and we'll take a look. Now I did mention I was going to sketch the plum pudding model again, and I'm setting up for that right now. So I'm making my supposed spherical cloud of positive charge, right? And we've got our electrons, the little dots everywhere. Now the four arrows you see moving left to right, these are Rutherford's alpha particles that he's shooting through. Now, if there were no region of central area of positive charge, the nucleus, if there were no nucleus, then the plum pudding results would actually be observed. But it says there, plum pudding results not observed. The reason they're not observed is because Rutherford has just discovered the nucleus. Inside the middle of an atom is a very dense nucleus uh, that has positive charge because that's where the protons are that we know now, right? So these alpha particles on the perimeter can go right through. So the alpha particles that are close to the center of the atom, however, are either going to be deflected or reflected. So the deflected alpha particle and the reflected alpha particle that I've drawn, I've drawn one of each, right? They are proving that there is a region of positive, a, a dense region of positive charge that is kicking this alpha particle away from it or even reflecting it back. All right, so let's make a bullet point there and summarize what we've seen on the right-hand side. It says, most alpha particles pass directly through because the atom is mostly open space. Deflected particles, so I'm gonna have deflected particles and I'm gonna have reflected particles. And you can see an example on the right hand, on the sketch on the right hand side. Deflected particles are those that had come close to the positively charged center and then deflected away. Reflected particles had a direct hit with this positively charged center, and then they kind of rebounded or reflected directly back, all right? 
So Rutherford has just discovered the nucleus. All right, so at the top of a new page of notes here, we want to kind of make a, we want to make some notes on what we've just witnessed. So the first star up there, it says the densely packed center of the atom is called the nucleus. All right, again, this is 1911, Rutherford and his gold foil experiment, discovery of the nucleus. The densely packed center of the atom is called the nucleus, and that nucleus represents 99.99% of an atom's mass. Essentially, all of the atom's mass is the nucleus. In other words, protons and neutrons. Now, how dense is the nucleus? Well, when I think of something that's dense, I think of like a lead weight, right? A lead weight can be pretty small, and it's still really, really heavy. You know what I mean? But that has nothing on the nucleus. For example, if a nucleus was the size of a grain of sand, a little grain of sand, it would weigh 11 million pounds. Imagine a little tiny grain of sand that was lead. It would still weigh essentially nothing to you, right? So we, it's on a, we are, you and I are unable to comprehend just how dense a grain of sand being 11 million pounds is, okay?